dig You really wanna flip your lid Step up again and listen to the singer Every square, say a prayer When this money's is, dead, she'll make it you know, over This is how white men dance <laughs> I actually can't see the screen <laughs> That's got nothing to do with the sunglasses either, too, right, brother. That's just because well, you're old. True, yeah. It's because I'm old. So, so uh, here's I'll... my here's my goal. Here's my goal. Can we put this on my job scorecard? Crispy butter. Uh, crispy butter's job scorecard. <laughs> that within six months, I'll be playing the funk music on my bass. Oh, when we yes. Start this. Yes. Maybe not six months. Give me a few more than that. But that's my goal. This is Absolutely. the base as we open up. Absolutely, brother. This is um song called Sassy. Oh, listen, man. Who is this? I don't know this one. It's Kurt Elling and Charlie Hunter. It's a song called Sassy. Oh, listen to that Rhodes, man. Oh, man. Stop it. Stop it. Get out of here. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Agency Hour here live in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group. My name is Troy Dean. This is... Pete Perry. Perry. Pete Crispy Butter Perry. Crispy Butter Perry. Crispy Butter Perry. That's you're just always going to be here on after known as Crispy Butter. I'm going to get you a bomber jacket, right, with the Agency Mavericks logo on it and crispy butter written on this on this breast here. Uh, crispy butter. Like, for those of you who have met Pete in real life, you'll know he's like the furthest thing from crispy butter you can get. <laughs> but he's, uh, he's just got that voice, man. Yeah, he's been you, uh, I, I think on one of these, what did you use? Oh, Silence is Golden. On one of the Silence is Golden um, episodes, you described me as 10% grumpy. That's right. 10% grumpy. <laughs> now that you've worked more with me, would you would you raise yeah. that percentage? Oh, yeah. It's at least 33% grumpy now. <laughs> well, what I realized is that you're not actually grumpy. You're just from New York. <laughs> well, that's and, probably uh, true, yeah. too, yeah. So the, other, the other New Yorker who I think is more grumpy than you is Victor Ramirez, and he's not grumpy at all. He's just really <laughs> from New York, right? He's just like, yeah, yeah. it's just, a, it's a, there's a certain kind of, I remember when I was in, Manhattan for the first time, there is a certain directness that you get from people, which I really enjoy because you know exactly where you stand. Yeah. There is no yeah. room for interpretation, right? <laughs> you're a jerk means you're a jerk, right? right. It's like there's no room for interpretation. Right. You know exactly where you stand. Hey, uh, how have you been, dude? What's been going on? You're getting ready I, to go to Italy, right? I am leaving for Italy on uh, my Tuesday, your Wednesday. Yep. That is just yep. like I can't leave my house without being shot right now here in Australia, and you're going to Italy. That's just unbelievable. The, the only the only concern is that we have to have a test 72 hours before we fly out, and uh, right. God forbid that test comes back negative. I mean positive. Right. So then well, what if it does? But you just have to. Then stay we have home. to cancel. Then we can't. We have to stay home. Yeah, we can't right. cancel everything. Right. So. Uh, well, uh, well done. Where, and whereabouts you go? You go to the Amalfi Coast. Yeah, I'm going to Rome, Naples, and the Amalfi Coast. Yeah, son of a bitch. All right, man, the Amalfi Coast is. Just, have you, you've been, haven't you? I haven't been to the Amalfi Coast. Oh. I've been to Rome several times, and oh my god, like Umbria and Florence and stuff. We, it, it, we, I remember going to the Amalfi Coast and uh, almost having a heart attack on the bus getting there. Uh, we yeah. went to, um, we went to uh, what's it called? I've forgotten the name of the town. Positano. Positano. We, we were staying in Positano and we got the bus to Positano and I remember almost having a heart attack on the way there on the bus. And then uh, I remember, I remember the, like my wife and I are quite uh, energetic people, you could say, right? We talk a bit. Yeah. And uh, I remember getting to the hotel and walking down these like, you know, cobblestone stairs to the reception and then being met by the, you know, concierge or the, the bellboy and then being shown to our room. We walked into our room. We walked out onto the balcony of our room and and the view. My wife and I stood there for half an hour and couldn't speak. Just staring at it, yeah. It's, yeah. it's breathtaking. It's uh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. In Malfi Coast, one of the most beautiful Yeah, we've been, we've been wanting to do this for a while. This is our... Uh celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary which was back a few years a few months ago yeah um, when we couldn't travel so now we're yeah. we're able to do it and looking forward well to done. it so yeah well done and i'm, and well I'm done. completely unplugging good on you my my agency is going to run itself my team's going to yeah. run the agency and 
I'll yeah. be unplugged for like 14 days. I'm going to vox you every yeah. day to ruin your holiday. I figured you would. I'm going to send support tickets to your staff and just scream at them every day until they text you and get you on the phone. I'm uh-huh. determined to ruin your holiday. You <laughs> so uh, I'm here in lockdown in Melbourne. Not that I'm resentful. There's no resentment going on here whatsoever. No. Um, congratulations. Don't send me any photos, all right? I don't want to know. Yeah. Um, hey, for those of you who are watching, if anyone is still watching, let us know what country you're from in the comments so that we can, you know, translate this show live in real time so that you can understand what we're talking about. That would be a cool trick if we could do that. Let us know in the comments to prime the algorithm so that more people see the show. That's really why we want you to engage. We don't That's actually right. care who you are or where you're from or what you think. We just want you to prime the algorithm for us. Um, this is the Agency Hour. It's a live stream we're doing every week here in the Digital Mavericks Facebook group. We are going to turn this into a podcast very soon. Yes, we are. Um, not yet, though. Max and I are having an arm wrestle about that. Uh, but we are going to turn this into a podcast. We're just in preparation and pre-production uh, phase. We have Robert Macklin here from the United States, Laurie Dean from the US. Facebook user is – oh, hang on, there we go. Someone is calling me from Chester Heights in PA. Is that Pennsylvania? PA? Yes, it is. Yes. There you go. Someone's calling me from Chester Heights in Pennsylvania. I'm sorry. You'll have to wait. I'm live on Facebook right now. Um, Helen is locked down here in Australia. Uh, someone is here from Atlanta in the house. Christopher Stratman is here from the US. Somebody's here from Canada. Andrew Tate is here from Yorkshire in the UK. Uh, somebody's here from the San Francisco Bay Area. Awesome. Good, good, good. Um, well, today is a very exciting day because we have a very special guest joining us and I'm really excited about this topic. Over the years, I want to I want to ask Pete this question. How have Uh-oh. you – here we go. How – it's not. It's all right. It's not your name. It's nothing tricky. It's not your name or your date of birth, right? It's, it's fairly yeah. straightforward. How have you managed to price projects in the past and not go broke? And I'm making an assumption that you've managed to do that. Right. Yeah. So, um, I so this I'm very interested in, in hearing our speaker speak about this because um, I've always uh, really focused on value pricing. So I try to get from the client what their budget is and try to kind of make that work and make it profitable. Um, and it, whether I'm, I mean, I know I'm profitable, but I don't know how profitable I really truly am. I think that it, I could be doing a much better job of, of the pricing. And uh, I'm really interested in hearing our speaker present you, about this topic. Do you track time? Do you track your team's time? My team does track their time. Yes. Yes. Um, mm. But I don't necessarily do a great job at the end of a project of going back and yeah, um, figuring out, figuring out, yeah. you know, did, were we really? Now, I have the advantage of I'm um, I'm using Filipino staff, so mm-hmm. when you're paying eight, ten dollars an hour, mm-hmm. it's almost hard not to be profitable. Yeah, <laughs> but, the economics but, make uh, sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. It's I I think it's interesting the things that we don't factor in uh, into pricing, and I'm we're going to unpack this in a moment. But also, what I'm really excited to see here is that we've there's you know, um, uh, my friend here, who we're going to introduce in a moment, shared with this with me in Messenger recently, and I saw a sneak peek into it. And I think this is going to help all of us understand the real cost of developing, designing, and developing a website. Because I think most of us wing it. I know I did for years. I kind of took it. I went, well, I think they've got eight grand. I think I can get eight grand out of them without damaging the relationship. And I reckon I can do it for eight grand and make some money. And then. Right you kind of realize six weeks into the project, I'm going to stab this person in the face because I'm losing money every day because they haven't got their content and they keep moving the scope and now they want a fucking membership site and they want e-commerce and like, I'm going to throw myself off a building or stab them, one or the other. And that's what happens when you guess, right? So That's exactly what happens, Um, especially if you don't have those boundaries in place for Right. Go creep and all that stuff. You have to have that in place too. And who has those boundaries in place when you're starting out? Because you just want to do everything you possibly can to keep the client happy because they've got the money. Right. Right. And you Uh, have, you have a little lizard brain with scarcity. That's right. Yeah. And, um, and, and I, you know, I learned this from reading pitch anything from Oren Claff. He's like, the first thing you got to do is, is reframe the, the relationship so that you're the prize, not them, even though they've got the money. Cause remember, 
you know, for those, anyone watching or listening, if we haven't offended you yet and you haven't tuned out, anyone watching or listening, remember, you, you know how to do something that less than 0.01% of the population of the world know how to do. And yet we sure. continue to give it away for free or not enough money to be profitable. So nice segue. Without further ado, I think I would like to welcome to the stage my good friend, founder, CEO, and extraordinaire, entrepreneur extraordinaire from uh, Southern California and running Dude Agency. I don't know, actually, I don't know if he's in Southern California or Mexico, but he'll correct me. The one and only Chris Martinez. Come on down. Hello. Hello. Hey, nice brother. to see you all again. <laughs> I like the way I like the turn and the wave, like he's addressing the room. Excellent. Well, I am looking out a window right now, so I'm addressing some construction guys across the way. <laughs> well, you have to do whatever we have to do to to emulate the live experience, right? Exactly. Now that we're in a virtual world. I was now, having a lot of fun listening to you guys go back and forth bantering. Uh, <laughs> the Pete, Pete, the guy that called you Krispy Kreme as opposed to buttercream or whatever, that was hilarious. I was dying. <laughs> Already enjoying this this uh, this event that we're hosting today. Well, that's the main that's the main thing. As long as uh, as long as you're having fun, that's why we're here. Uh, now, for, listen for those who have no idea who you are and what you do, uh, just give us the too long didn't read version. Yeah, sure. So I started an agency back in 2012. Uh, grew that agency. We had over 200 something clients on retainer. Uh, and then decided that I was going to launch a essentially an outsourcing company in 2017. One of the secrets to my success was that we built a team down in Tijuana, Mexico, which nobody even at the time definitely thought about going down to Mexico for design and development help. And um, so then I decided in 2017, I was going to launch Dude and help other agencies get access to this hidden talent pool and uh, grew that company uh, or we've you know been growing Dude ever since. 2018 was kind of our breakout year. We went from uh, four or five to 29 staff. Now we have over 90 people. We won. Uh, we won an award last year for minority-owned business uh, of the year, as well as a silver, which is like second place for most innovative company under a hundred people. Um, wow! So we're excited about that. And so this That's year awesome. we should double what we did last year. Um, wow! Which is fantastic. So breaking that multi-million-dollar mark. And the best part is that we're very profitable. <laughs> so that's awesome. why I'm excited to share with you guys all the things that I've learned because it hasn't always been like this. And I've been able to kind of see what's the, the, some of the main reasons why. And I ran, my agency was primarily a web development agency. Um, so, you know, I'm super excited to share uh, how all of you guys can make more money because you guys deserve to make a lot of money. <laughs> this business is very, very difficult. And like you mentioned, yeah. you all have a skill set that not many people on the planet have, and you deserve to be paid adequately for helping these other businesses. 100%. Where, where, where are you based? Are you based in California or Mexico? Yeah, so I live in Mexico. So I've been living in right. Tijuana for about three years, a little over three okay. years, actually about three and a half. Um, oh. And But our company is based in the States. So right. I go back and forth pretty frequently. Yeah. Um, and the agency, the agency that you had before Dude was in California? Yes. Uh, so our company is technically still based in, like the headquarters is in California. Uh, and, and so I was living in San Diego up until 2018. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I met my fiance, who also is our CFO. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we moved in together in 2018 and uh, been living here ever since. And I love it. That's, wow. that's how it's going to be when you get married, too. She's still going to be your CFO. CFO, that's right. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I was joking. You can't spell finance without the word fiance. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, now, um, when why Mexico? Like when you, you so you're in San Diego, you're building a team. Why did you? Yeah. So you know, like everybody in the states, for the most part, when we think of outsourcing, we think of going to the Philippines or India or now Europe, Central Europe. Um, and I like to say, like we always think uh, of looking to the left and to the right. We never, ever think about looking up or down. And so I was living in San Diego at the time. I'm originally from Los Angeles. And I was like, you know what? I bet you I can find a team down in Mexico. And granted, I don't really speak Spanish very well. Definitely don't understand the culture. But I just had a hunch um, and went across the border, ended up building a team. And you know, a lot of bumps and bruises along the way, but figured it out. And the time zone was absolutely crucial for us. Because prior to moving our staff down to Mexico, 
I had people in the Philippines and that first two years of running their company, I was up. I was, my day was 6 a.m. to 1 a.m. every single day. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. And you can't run those hours. And what was the biggest problem? Um, and we still have a few staff in the Philippines, but the biggest problem was that we would have issues in the middle of the day mm -hmm. and then my team would be asleep. Mm -hmm. And how am I supposed to tell my customer, well, can you just wait until they wake mm -hmm. up? Like some <laughs> problems, you just can't wait, right? You got to be yeah, able yeah. to fix it right away. Yeah. Um, and I'm not super technically inclined. And so that was really hurting our customer experience. And that was ultimately stifling our growth. Mm -hmm. And I just knew that I had to find people that could work my time zone. And, uh, you know, India, you can find people that will work a, a graveyard. Philippines, it's very, very hard to find people that will mm -hmm. work their graveyard shift because family is so important in their mm -hmm. culture. They mm -hmm. will not sacrifice family time. And I completely mm -hmm. respect that. Just mm -hmm. doesn't really totally. work for us. Right? Yeah. So <clears throat> that's why Mexico was an absolute godsend for us. Plus I, you know, I was driving across the border every single day. Um, and it was only about a 30 minute drive. Yeah. From me. San Diego to Tijuana is a half hour. Yeah. Stone mm -hmm. throw away, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so, um, you know, I was driving down every day. We had an office down there and being able to sit face to face with people was fantastic. Um, mm. So that was, you know, really what helped make the difference for us. I, I've entertained, we had one of our staff was doing a night shift at one point <clears throat> when we were, I don't know, doing something, they were manning live chat during one of our launches or something. I felt really bad. I'm like, I don't want you to work nights. I don't want to work nights. I don't want right. you to work nights, right? Because <clears throat> it completely screws up your day. You're just exhausted. You don't get to spend any time with your friends or family during the day anyway because you need to sleep. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't expect anyone to work nights because I don't want to do it. And, um, and I don't think it's good long term. I don't think it's sustainable long term. I don't think it's good for people's health to work uh, to work night shift. Right, anyway, um, so how did you know? By the way, l l luckily, Max, we're not turning this into a podcast just yet because I wasn't even using the right microphone at the start of the show because right? <laughs> I'm an idiot, right? So there's a few bugs we need to iron out before we start producing a podcast. Um, so you, you so you start building your team in Mexico when you've got the agency. How did you how did you approach pricing when you had the agency? So we had productized services. So we essentially had packages mm -hmm. that we were selling over and over and over. I didn't learn the things that I'm going to teach you until recently. Had I known these, I would have completely changed my pricing <laughs> because while we had a ton of clients, um, we were not very profitable back then. Mm -hmm. And, and what, I, what, what were you doing? What services were you putting? Well, so what, what we did was website, mm -hmm. ongoing support, content. So we did blog posts every single month. Um, what else did we offer? We did Facebook ads for a little while mm -hmm. and then just general like marketing strategy. Like we had a whole roadmap that we would take them through and helping them to create their value proposition and things like, you know, so, um, we had a lot you of, and I didn't even, you and I didn't even know each other back then, right? it's like, it, it's, yeah, I didn't, I didn't even you know that stuff, you right? existed. I did not oh, nice. know that coaches mm -hmm. for running an agency existed. You know, this yeah. is back in 2016, 2015 when yeah. I was really hammering the websites. Yeah. Um, and we had lots and lots of projects going on in any, mm. any given time. It was a mm. very, very, you know, labor intensive operation. Mm. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, but looking back, of course, there's so many things that I would have done differently, primarily with the pricing yeah. and, and part of the issue. Well, I don't know if you want me to start kind of like yeah. getting into the totally. details. Totally. Absolutely. So, you know, like Pete, I think you were mentioning this, like we just kind of guess when it comes to how we're supposed to quote out a project. A new project, for example. So we like, ah, this one's kind of similar. You know, I'm going to, I think it's going to be around the same, right? And so you, you just kind of throwing it to the wall, hoping that it sticks. And the real reason why we don't make enough money with our website projects is because we just flat out don't have the right data. And like Pete, you mentioned that you guys are time tracking. I would say that you're probably in the 5% of agencies that are right. diligently time tracking. Yep. And I'm talking about nobody is, is, is missing it because what happens a lot of the time is that people will time track and then they get lazy and then they don't do it for like a week and we yep. are too busy doing our own thing. So what happens now we're not collecting the right data. We're not, we're missing out on like 25% of the data that we need. So we need, accurate data. That is the biggest reason why we don't time track. And I'm, I'm going to explain it to you in the context of, of a restaurant analogy. So I don't know, did any of you guys work in a restaurant ever? 
Pete, you did? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think I did. I worked in a bar, but not a restaurant. Okay. So it's similar, right? So I, when I was uh, in high school, this is in the mid nineties, I worked at Chuck E. Cheese. I'm sure oh, God. you know what Chuck E. Cheese is. So Chuck E. Cheese, let's call it a pizzeria. Um, yeah. it, it, it was an absolute cash cow. Like I worked at the register and you would not believe how much money flowed through that place. So on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, below our register, we had this little box. It was a, a wooden box with a little slot inside of it, and there was a lock on the door. And so, anytime you had a bunch of hundreds or twenties, you had to drop them and drop them underneath, yeah, yeah. right? And, and so, um, there was five registers. Each of them had their own little cash box. On a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the manager would have to come by and empty out that box because it would get so full that you literally could not shove more hundred dollar bills in there. They would have to clean it out three times an hour. Three wow. times an hour. Whoa. That is an insane that's, amount of cash. So this is before that's everybody an insane was amount of, That's an insane amount of screaming children is what that is. <laughs> See, when I when they came to me, the kids were already running around going crazy. I only had right. to deal with the adults, right. who I think was actually worse. But so the, the point of the story is that there was so much money flowing through this place. And they were able to pay their managers a lot of money because they had a lot of cash and profit. Uh, as well. So there, the general manager of the store, he told me this young guy is like in his mid twenties. He was making 80 grand a year managing a Chuck E. Cheese in 1997. Wow. Now, I don't know what the equivalent of that is today, but it's at least 140. Oh, at least, at least wow. for, right? for a 20 something year old kid managing a pizza place. Yeah. Now he wasn't just some dummy off the street. He went to law school, decided he didn't want to do law. <laughs> they recruited him. All the other managers were making at least 50K, right? And the, the reason that they were able to do this is because they had such, uh, such good systems and they managed their numbers. So when I ran up an order, like the most popular thing was a package. It was like a large Supreme pizza, breadsticks, four sodas, and tokens. Uh, it was like 40 bucks. So $40. This $40 you know, in 1997. Play they play games with the tokens, Trey. Yeah, oh, the tokens it, for the it. coins for the machines. Got it. Um, the guy who started Chuck E. Cheese, by the way, Nolan Bushnell, he was the one of the founders of Atari. So that was the reason why they started yeah. the uh, Chuck E. Oh. Cheese to showcase oh. the games. Oh. So so ultimately, of all the things that I was ringing up for 40 bucks, the, the tokens literally are worth nothing. Um, they're, you're mainly paying for the pizza. So a $30 large pizza in 1997 is really what you're paying for. Right. Um, so when I rang up the order, the, it would go back to the kitchen and then the cooks, they had a little printout and the printout said, if it's a, this size pizza and they have these toppings, this is how much they get in weight. So if you have a large Supreme pizza, you get this much weight in pepperonis, this much weight in bell peppers, this much weight in mushrooms. So it would take longer for them to weigh out the food. Yes. But the, the Chuck E. Cheese knew that their biggest expense was going to be the food, the ingredients. So they had to manage the food costs. Food goes is perishable as well. So they couldn't overestimate. They couldn't underestimate. They had to get it perfectly right. Hmm. So um, that is ultimately why Chuck E. Cheese was so profitable because if they were selling a pizza for 30 bucks, they were going to make damn sure that that was going to get out the door and to the customers for $5. And then they could reinvest those profits back into hiring the best people possible so that they can, can keep this machine running and everybody is making a ton of money. Hmm. So what does that have to do with the web design business? Well, ultimately, we also have food costs. So in our business, what do you guys think are the ingredients? Well, the labor. Talent. Yeah. The, people. Team. the team. The people. Yeah. Really, it's time. It's time, guys. Yeah. So we have to manage that time to the second. And there's a quote that I found, uh, and it goes, uh, take care of the seconds, and the dollars will take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. It's so unbelievably true. That's why we have to be time tracking. Everybody on your team has to be time tracking, and they all have to be doing it consistently. Hmm. Now, Time is not the only way to do your pricing, though. I do want to say that. So, like, value-based pricing, absolutely the best way to do it. But at the same time, you can't be 
naive about the time that it's going to take to do a project. Even sure. though a client says my budget's a hundred grand and you're like, okay, yeah, I can absolutely create a project for a hundred grand. You do need to double check and make sure that your labor costs are not going to exceed that. In general, I tell every agency owner, simple rule of thumb, if whatever you're going to charge the client, you need to be able to get that project out the door, everything included, project management, design, development, copywriting, everything for 30%. 30% is the goal. So if you sell it for 10, you need to be able to get it out the door for three. Yep. That is a very, very easy rule that everybody can, should be able to understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to guarantee that you can get it done for 30%? You go back to your time logs and you say, it's way easier if you're productized too, but you go back to your time logs and you say, okay, this was what took, took this many hours. Now, what we do internally, and I know that most people don't have the ability to do this, but I highly recommend it. At least once a quarter, you run a report with your accountant, or if you have you know, a fiance that's your CFO, that helps too. Um, you run a report and you say, okay, so this is how much we spent in labor, and this is how much we charged the client, and this was the actual margin. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if your staff are on salary, still break it out into an hourly rate. Mm -hmm. And that way you can basically pair up hours and time and you can see to the penny. I know at dude, and this is what's helped us to grow. I know how much money we make with every single customer because we do, you know, flat rate for every, everybody. And, um, mm -hmm. we run a report every month mm -hmm. and I can see how many clients, how many hours each client is using, how many, what team members were contributing to those hours because each team member has a different salary or lots of the team members have different salaries. So I can see exactly to the penny how much we spent on every customer. And then I can go in and be like, hey, we need to give this person an upsell. This person's fine. You know, this person's in the red zone. We have a red zone thing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so like you guys can do the same. It doesn't have to be as in-depth with me because my business is a little bit different now than your guys is. But you mm -hmm. need to look, to look at those numbers. And mm -hmm. that data, that data will give you what you need so you can make better decisions moving forward. Awesome. I got two questions. Can I? Can I, get, I got two questions. I want to absolutely, answer. absolutely. One, the lizard brain needs to know the answer to this question. What do you use to track time for all your staff? You're using like fantastic question. I was literally just about to say that. So we use Freshdesk as our ticketing system because we have a uh -huh. ticketing model. So everybody submits a ticket inside of Freshdesk. Uh, literally, each agent goes in and they click their, they start their time and they stop their time. Got we it. check it every single week too. So each team member, team leader is responsible for checking all the team members. Okay. But if you don't have something like that, yeah. ClickUp has a yeah. built-in time tracking yeah. feature. It does. Yeah, yeah. Um, the people that I know that use it absolutely yeah. love it. Yeah. yeah. Cool so, so how do you, here's the thing about um, how do you get, a, how do you position this to your team so that, right? because because here's the thing right if i was working for you and you said to me i have to track my time i'd, I'd be like you know that iron maiden song run for the hills <laughs> yeah that's what i'd be doing right because i don't like to be micromanaged i like to feel autonomous exactly right? and so this is where the position? leadership skills really come into play okay i'm gonna ask you guys like you you, you Paul, both of you probably have this already answered but like if you were to ask your team and you ask them, what's the company mission? Do you think that everybody would answer the same? Uh, so with agency Mavericks, yes, I do. I do think okay. that we would all, some of us, some of them would probably have to look it up, but they, they know where to look at least. But with my team, um, probably just my, what I would consider my leadership team, which is one other person. Yeah. I highly recommend that if you've not tried this exercise, do it. It will be an absolute rude awakening for you, but it will be one of the best things that you can do. This is where people start to feel like there's micromanagement happening because they don't understand their role in the bigger picture of what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. At Dude, we are trying to change the way that people look at Latin America for design and development. Hmm. It's a very, very big mission. We have three missions actually, but that's one of them. We want everybody to look at Latin America as the number one place to go for mm. design and development. Mm. Love it. And we know that that is not the case right now. Mm -hmm. 
Case in point, go to Netflix, type in Mexico into the search bar and see what pops up. Knuckles. <laughs> yeah. Just drugs and killing people, right? Yeah, right. My wife's reading a book at the moment called American Dirt. Right? It's just like, it's that, that exactly. The, the crazy thing is I've got friends of mine who live in Mexico, right? They're from Australia. They're ex-customers of mine. They're now, they went to Mexico for a holiday. They got stuck there during COVID. They can't get out. I want to call with her the other day and I'm like, I'm going to ask you a question. I've never been to Mexico, right? I think I've asked you this, Chris, before. Is it dangerous? Because I would love to go to Mexico, but I'm shit scared because the messaging we get here in Australia is like, there were a couple of Australian surfers who were in Mexico who got murdered, right? That's all we hear. We yeah, don't hear the good stories because, of course, good stories don't sell newspapers. So we just hear and we see narcos and we and we, it's just like, well, fuck, I'm not going to New Mexico because I'm going to get killed. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like any big any big city has dangerous parts. Yeah. Um, there are parts of Mexi Mexico that are more dangerous. Um, I have personally never, ever felt unsafe in Mexico. Mm -hmm. I just stayed at the really nice parts. Like, why would I ever go to the dangerous parts? I have no reason to go. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I tell everybody come down and we actually have uh, clients coming down on Monday. Um, we're going to take them for a tour. Yeah. And so like, we just stay to the nice parts. You know, it, it is 100% safe, safe if you use your brain and you stay in yeah. the nice parts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, if anyone, any of our team are watching this, what is our mission? Let us know in the comments, please. Anyone on our team watching this, uh, if you know what our mission is, don't go look it up on the website. Uh, it's interesting because we're having a debate about this internally at the moment. Uh, let us know in the, in the comments. It's right. all right. You won't so, get fired if you don't know the answer. It's fine. <laughs> so I should get fired getting, if you don't know the answer because it's my job to communicate it, right? Exactly. So that's exactly what I was about to say is uh, it is our job as the leaders, as the CEOs of the company to convey this mission to our team members. Once they understand that they are playing a role in a much bigger mission that we have as a company, mm -hmm. you it's much easier to convey this message of here's why we need to time track. So it's not, hey, we need to time track so that we can make more money and Chris can go take another vacation mm -hmm. or Chris needs to go buy a new car. So you guys need to work harder. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really inspire anybody. You know, no. that that's bad leadership. I think we can all agree on that. Yeah, it's we all deserve to uh, grow or we want to grow our company. So the more that we make from with our clients by serving them, the more we can reinvest back into the company. That means getting you guys better equipment, obviously getting you guys bonuses. That also means creating new job opportunities. Mm -hmm. The better we do as a company, the more that we can reinvest in hiring new people and creating new opportunities for people that are gonna be positively impacted by our company. Mm. Our staff, they absolutely love working for our company. They, they have never found a work environment like what we provide. Mm -hmm. So they're very passionate about anything that helps us to grow. So I don't, I like, I'm not one of these CEOs that has a problem sharing sales data with us or like revenue or mm -hmm. profit. Like we are very, very transparent about that. Mm -hmm. Now what helps is I have amazing people mm -hmm. and they, we screen them and we know that they have this internal thing where they feel an obligation to serve other people. They're willing to sacrifice themselves for the good of the team. That's what we look for in our team members. <clears throat> A couple of things I want to uh, uh, um, touch on here. Um, Kyle Kurokawa says, never knew about the 30%. That's actually mind-blowing. 70% profit sounds quite nice, but how do I not feel like I'm stealing from my new awesome client? Let's be clear. The 30% is your cost of delivering the product so the 70% you have left over is gross profit, gross. right? Out of that 70%, you have to run the business. You've got to pay rent. You've got to pay insurance, legal fees. You've got to pay yourself. Any, you got to pay yourself. yourself any non-production staff. You taught me this in the pro forma, right? So yeah. you've got to pay all the, you know, the office equipment, like all the stuff that you've got to pay to run the business. And the idea is that out of that 70%, you pay all your running expenses, you should end up with at least 30% net profit at the end of the day after you've paid yourself a wage or a salary, right? Yep. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that for Cobb. The other question I wanted to ask is, do you what profit do you share with your team? Do you share gross or net? Uh, we share net. We share like net. numbers. So numbers. Yeah. You like so at the end of the year, we'll share the net. Right. Yeah. Like so just share, let's share, share the, the numbers net. or actually share the profit? Uh, we'll share the, the actual number. We'll share like what we made as a company. Cool. Because it's been negative before. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. want them to know, hey, we suffered. Um, yeah, yeah. We also we also bonus out everybody. So 
this is what I want. I want to be very clear on the differences between gross and net because I didn't learn this until fairly recently. So gross is ultimately in our business, gross is what's left over after you're paying your production labor staff. Mm -hmm. And other like credit card expenses, credit card processing expenses, things like that. Yeah. But let's just say for the most part, it's it's labor expenses, right? Mm -hmm. So, and this is production labor. So anybody who's touching uh, deliverables that are being done for clients, that's considered mm -hmm. production labor. Project manager? Right? Project manager. I consider that production labor. Production, right. Because if you weren't delivering the thing for the client, the project manager wouldn't be in the building. They wouldn't right? exist. They would not exist. Got it. Got it. So... Uh, production labor, typically you want to keep that at that 30% mm -hmm. and it'll grow as your revenue grows. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, your production labor budget also grows as a percentage. Mm -hmm. So 30% of 10,000, 3,000, 30% 3, mm -hmm. of 20,000, 6,000. Now we have mm -hmm. more budget to reinvest into the team. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's left over after that then? Uh, you, you're uh, deducting your administrative and, administrative and operating expenses. Mm -hmm. Within that is your salary as a CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, other um, COO, if you have a COO, finance director, HR, like all those other people who are helping you to run the company. Mm -hmm. Rent is included in that as well. And then what's le left over after that is your net profit. Mm -hmm. Now that bare, bare minimum should be at 20%. Yeah, Think of right. the net income as the salary that you pay to your company. Think of your company as an employee. Mm -hmm. Every 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 company has to have their uh, every business, their company has an employee, right? Mm -hmm. That's the company is the employee. That's kind of um, like the easy way that I think about it. So I'm going to pay my company, my favorite employee, at least 20%. Wow. That's really interesting. Ben Monk asks sales and marketing. I think what he's asking is sales and marketing and sales commissions. What are they? Um, so this is where it, it kind of, it's an art and, a, and not necessarily a science. That's I right. consider sales and marketing as part of my administrative costs. Yeah, same. Okay. Um, same. I know some people that will roll it into their cost of goods. So it, it really comes down to however you want to do it. If, if it's me, I just keep it as an admin operating expense. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so the, the, I, it's got to be, it's just got to be consistent, right? Like if yeah. you, oh yeah. So we, I, we used to treat our Facebook ad cost as a cost of sale, but we don't now it's, it's now it's an, it's an operating, it's an admin operating cost, right? Even though it's right. significant, it's a, because I'm like, well, it, that's just a part of running the business, right? That's not, that doesn't, the, the, our main cost now is our coaches. Our main cost of sale is our coaches and the development of our IP and our product development. So we have Kat who develops all of our playbooks and takes our IP and turns them into teaching frameworks. She's a cost of, she's a direct cost, right? She's basically a cost of sale. Uh, our ClickUp implementation guy who's building out all of our kits in ClickUp, that's a cost of product because that's what we're actually selling to our clients. The coaches, they're a cost of sale, right? Because that's, that's what it's costing me to produce the thing that I'm selling. Advertising, yep. we now just put that below that line. So it affects our net profit, not our gross. Yeah. Is anybody still watching? Because I know we're talking about really, really boring stuff. Dude, <laughs> like our, we got, our viewership just almost doubled. We got 60 oh, people perfect. watching this live right now. Awesome. Yeah. I love it. And those um, who, guys, I know that like this is half not... of those people are frothing at the mouth and the other half are asleep and they don't even know what they're looking at. And that's totally <laughs> fine. Well, for everybody who's still awake, thank you so much for paying attention. I know that this isn't the most exciting things, but I can tell you this is what separates agency owners who are making a ton of money and not having to break their back to do it and agency owners who are struggling and not yeah. getting paid what they deserve. Dude, can, dude, I always call you dude, which is weird because you own a company called dude. Uh, can I just say, right, that I know a lot of people think this is not, a lot of people think this is kind of like boring stuff and or not, not sexy, right? Check this out. When you're sitting on the beach, you want to talk about sexy, right? When you're sitting on the beach, sipping a pina colada with your fiance and your kids or whatever it is, and you, and money is landing in your bank account, right? That doesn't get any sexier than that, right? Absolutely. Anyone, anyone who's in that position has been through the stuff that we're talking about now. So you want to talk about like having the, you know, what is like the sexiest thing you can talk to entrepreneurs about? It's about having recurring revenue land in your bank account without you being on the keyboard and without you being on the tools. Well, you don't get there without doing this work. So this is the foundational stuff that allows you to go have a good party 
and not go not go broke. Hundred percent. You know, so since since April, and I'm not trying to make you jealous, Troy, because I know you're locked down. Uh, since April, I've been to Puerto Vallarta. I've been to Huatulco in Oaxaca. I've been to Chichen Itza. I've been to Cancun. I've swam in two cenotes. I mean, like, and I'm getting married next month. And I'm going to be taking the whole month of October off. I don't even know what a cenote is. <laughs> cenotes are like the most amazing thing ever. One of the best right. things that you can do in, in I'll have to Cancun. Look that up. Um, so yes, this is, if you can master these things, this lifestyle that we all have like dreamed of since we started the agency, it's a hundred percent possible. Just got to get really deep into the non-sexy stuff. Um, so anyways, let let me get back on track. Um, unless there's any other questions. Oh, dude, I'm here to distract you. That's my job. So, you know, (laughs) so, so let's let's do, let's just do some, uh, a really simple math exercise. I want you to take what you want to make personally make this year. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to do a hundred thousand dollars. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's the goal for this year, hundred thousand bucks. And I'm going to take a hundred thousand and I'm going to divide it by the number 2087 mm-hmm. bonus points. If anybody knows what 2087 stands for the number of hours in a year. Yes. Yeah. So if you work a 40 hour work week, which we know none of us Where's do. Where's the seven come from? I don't know. 2080. I just it. It's, well, it's because you take, it's because you take a half hour lunch break, right? Um, yeah, exactly. The, the, uh, does that include for? Does that include annual leave? The two thousand and eighty-seven hours. Is that this is America. Like, we don't get Amer- annual leave. <laughs> 40, 40 times fifty-two. Forty so times fifty-two is twenty eighty. Okay, you can take it by twenty eighty. It doesn't really make that big of a difference yeah. uh, when the math. Wait, when no, I'm just saying. I'm telling Troy where the number comes from. It's right. Forty okay. times. So, so okay. weeks. Okay. If I want to make a hundred thousand dollars an hour uh, for the year, then that means that I need to average forty-eight dollars an hour. I don't know if you can uh-huh. see that on my camera. Yeah, there we go. Okay. okay. Yeah. So you should not be doing anything that's less than $48 an hour, just so you know. Oh, yeah. I agree with that. So when you're looking at how you personally are investing your time, if it's less than 48 bucks an hour, and, and I understand when we're starting out, we have to do a lot of the grunt work. I have clean bathrooms. I literally have painted my office on a weekend. Mm-hmm. So I know what it's like to have to do that. But you need to get to a point where you are not doing work that's below what you deserve to be paid. Mm-hmm. And guess what else lowers your hourly rate? Working yeah. more than 40 hours a week. Absolutely. So if you're working more than 40 hours a week, mm. that's going to lower it. The that's goal, good. though, is it okay if we work less hours and make more money? Is that okay? Like, can we totally. give ourselves permission to do that? Yes, yeah, it's yeah. totally okay. So anyways, getting back to the time tracking, um, another tool that I uh, that a friend of mine, Liam, runs, he runs a company called Time Doctor. That's another yeah, one. Yeah. Um, yep. Harvest is the elephant in the room. It's very complex. Integrates with your accounting system and everything. Yep. Click up. We Toggle. already talked about. Toggle is another really good one too. Quokify is another one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, yeah. So the, those are the big tools. So if you are not doing time tracking now, you must do it. Mm-hmm. Please make a commitment to yourself. Mm-hmm. that you will do this immediately. And I'm just talking about production labor. Don't feel like you have to do it for your sales time. It's important that if mm-hmm. you do that, you should do that. But for the sake of this conversation, just track production labor hours. Mm-hmm. Now, if you get into a position where you have team members that are just refusing to do it, mm-hmm. you're going to have some hard decisions to make because yeah. these might not be the team members that are going to help you get to that next level. That's right. It's very, very hard to straighten out your numbers and be able to make good future decisions without good data. Yeah. So you have to have people that are going to be on board with that. Yeah. If anybody a has question from, yes, a question from Michelle Parry that I want to talk about. She says, do you have to go over the border for affordable help? Would you be priced out? Rochelle, here's one thing I learned when I started hiring people in other countries. Yes, the economics makes sense. But also the numbers make sense. It's about the talent pool. So don't think of it just like, well, if I don't, if I don't go across the border and hire staff, I'm not going to be competitive, right? It's you're you just you're also open, you know, economically it makes sense, but also you're just opening yourself up to a to a bigger talent pool. I got a, I get a client here in Australia who is it, it like has a scalability issue because for for a long time he's just resisted hiring people offshore in fact he's resisted hiring people who aren't in his actual building right and he lives 
in kind of like the outer, not quite regional area of Australia, but he's like an hour and a half out of the city, right? Well, it's hard to attract good talent to drive out there and work in his building, right? So I've kind of coached him through the idea of having strategists work locally and having implementers work, he's predominantly an SEO agency, having implementers work elsewhere because you're tapping into a larger talent pool. Now, yes, that raises a whole bunch of other problems you're going to have in terms of like managing and culture and accountability and training and all that kind of stuff. But it's not just economics that, that uh, it, it, like that's not the only reason that you should look at hiring people in other countries. It's just tapping into a larger talent pool. I've worked with some people who do not live in Australia who are who put some of the Australian talent to shame, right? Yeah. Uh, that I, And I've hired Australian people who are, you know, I wouldn't say useless, but, you know, like just you can not, say in, the, useless. Come not on. in the right seat, right? Let's just say that. They went in the right seat. And then I've hired some people, you know, in other countries, like Pete, for example, who have just blown my mind, right? And who, who are like, so, I mean, I, I just think if I didn't, if I had borders around me, I wouldn't have access to that talent pool. We live in such a revolutionary time. And if COVID proved anything, it's that we can work remote. We were forced right. to do it for a freaking year. That's right. And we, so, we made it, guys. Yeah. So Cassandra, why- Cassandra brings up a good question. This is new to me hiring offshore. How do you deal with the negativity about not hiring locally? My team has been offshore for seven years now, and I've never had a client question it mm. even a little bit. Really, the really easy answer to that question is say to, the, say to the client, do you have a smartphone in your pocket? Yeah. Right. Where was that made? Right. It wasn't made in the United States of America, was it? So shut up. What are we talking yeah. about? Like, yeah. You know and, I mean? and, and the other side of that is, do you really want to be working with people who would even ask that question? Exactly. Right. I've you want off. them as your client. <laughs> I, I just will stop the sales conversation yeah. if there's any yeah. ever, ever any. And, and trust me, like I've heard it as a brown guy in the United States. <laughs> right. I've heard it all. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have to prove that I'm an American citizen for people to actually take me seriously. It wow. happens all the time. You just like walking with your passport open, do you? <laughs> well, because they hear me, and, and I can tell, like I can see it on the people's faces, and they're like, "Is this guy yeah. Mexican?" I'm like, "Well, I was born in Los Angeles, and I'm an American citizen." I happen to just ease that into yeah. the conversation, and then everything's like, ah, okay, cool. It's one of us. <laughs> I'm a boy now. Um, <laughs> <It's my> boy. <laughs> so Chris is in the house, <laughs> exactly. So anyways, um, yes, I wouldn't worry too much. You know, think about from the opportunity standpoint, um, kind of like the prosperity mindset. Like we have so many opportunities and we can share our wealth with so many people from around the world. And what I've found is that our staff in Mexico, they are so appreciative and oftentimes more appreciative of the opportunity than uh, a lot of our people in the the United States or a lot of people that I've encountered in the United States. So I don't care where you are. If you can do an amazing job for my clients and you can make my life easier, you will find a seat here at our company. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, And the yeah. best part is that no matter how much you're charging your clients, for the most part, you can find somebody that will fit your budget. I do have some absolute non, like you have to have these ones. One, you have to work my time zone. We do mm-hmm. not hire people who don't work my time zone. The yeah. second one is you, you have to speak English. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, at least my language, like I speak Eng- American. Um, you have to speak English, right? Th- those are my two, like, I-, I-, I will not compromise on those. Everything else doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Don't care where you're at. Mm-hmm. Love it. Um, uh, in-, in the time that we have left, do you want to do you want to share a screen? Yes, I do. Kind of show so, us what you've thank been you very working much, on. I was just about literally that was the next thing that I wanted to share, because the, yeah. the big question is, OK, so I'm going to start gathering the data. What if I don't have the data now? Yeah. I still need yeah. to price out my projects. Well, yeah. luckily, dude yeah. has been, been collecting projects on thousands and thousands of websites or what I should say we've been collecting data on thousands and thousands of websites over the past few years and we've tracked tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of hours and so we actually created a free uh, free platform that any of you guys can use um, and get access to this data that I keep talking about so I'm just going to share my screen really quickly and I'm going to let's see how do I go all right can you guys see my screen nope no now can you see my screen? Nope. When when Max adds it to uh, the broadcast. We're coming there. Yes, yes, we can. All right, cool. So uh, we created a platform. It's called Dude2Go. 
And basically what we did is we took all the website data that we've gathered over the years and we uploaded and we built a software and you can now get access to that data. So when you're going to quote out a project, you no longer have to guess. Okay, so it's super, super easy to use. Um, and so basically you just go here, I'm gonna continue as a guest. You put in your name, I'm gonna say Pete, and uh, what did we call him before? Krispy Kreme? Krispy Butter. Butter. Krispy <laughs> Butter. <laughs> Krispy Butter. And uh, we're gonna, well, I don't know, I'm just say dude. Uh, and then I'm gonna put in my email just for fun. Agency, what is my email? Oh, my phone number, this is my cell if anybody wants to text me. Uh, test, and then when do we want this completed by? So let's say I want this done by the 24th. And I want you guys to do a build for me. So let's say I'm a designer, I design everything in Figma, mm -hmm. and I want you to build it out in, oh, what happened to my Figma? I want you to build it out in Astra, with mm -hmm. Elementor Pro. So to mm -hmm. start, these are the three themes and builders that we're doing, Divi, Beaver, Astra. We're, we will continue to add more as we aggregate the data and upload it. Um, and then mm -hmm. Divi, Elementor, Beaver Builder. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna say Astra with Elementor Pro. I've got seven pages, mm -hmm. WP Engine. I don't have mockups yet. You can upload the link if you want so we can look at them. And I'm gonna include Yoast mm -hmm. and uh, Gravity Forms. Mm -hmm. Then I just click Submit. It goes over to our team. Now, in the future, after we kind of get through this beta program, it'll just flash on the screen. It'll say, it's gonna take you this amount of hours. And if you want dude to do it, it'll cost us much. <laughs> but what happens now is that it goes to our team and then very, very quickly, uh, we will contact you. And if you're looking for just the quote, we'll say, hey, this project is going to take on average about 82 hours to do mm -hmm. for the development. This is based on data, guys. This is not us just randomly guessing. We are checking your exact project against thousands of other projects that are just like the one that you wanna do. And this is the average of how long it's gonna take. So then what do you do with that information? You basically go in and you say, hey, okay, so it's gonna take me 82 hours. I'm going to then price it out at X amount of, uh, of dollars. So if your hourly rate, so I'm gonna stop my share. If your hourly rate is $150 an hour or whatever, you're not gonna charge less, you're not gonna charge them like thousand bucks. You're gonna go in there and you're gonna charge them the right amount. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what you can use dude to go for. And then if you want dude to do it, we'll give you the price on how much it'll cost us. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, and just be, clear, say, just be clear, you can get the quote without engaging your services. We don't oh, have yeah. to you hire get the dude. For free. You just right. Get the okay. get the data. Get the data for right. free. And then you have it and you can more accurately quote out how long it's going to take for on your end. Got it. It absolutely um, does not matter um, if you work with us or not. Just mm -hmm. take the data. Mm -hmm. Like that's the most powerful thing that we're giving you guys for free. Mm -hmm. Peter Butler says, do you have time to talk about your productizing in your agency? No, but we will definitely get Chris Martinez <laughs> back to talk about that at some point for sure. Um, and uh, Cassandra, he says, the comment wasn't from a racist standpoint. It was about employing locally first. I'm definitely proud of my guy. We have a wonderful relationship. Yeah, we get that, Cassandra. And and I just think it's a really good conversation to keep having mm -hmm. because, yeah. you know, like there are certain organizations, governments, large nonprofits that will just put an embargo on your stuff being developed offshore. That's fine. I never dealt with those clients because they're a pain in the ass. So um, uh, Kyle says, absolutely brilliant tool you've created. What is the link for people to go on and check this oh, out? Dude to go. Dude to go.io. Dude to go dot I O D U D E. Then the number two G O dot I O dude to go dot I O. Uh, so the next and guys, got, please uh, use the yeah. data. I'm telling you easy rule of thumb. Again, if you get a quote from us, like if dude says we're going to do it and it's going to be 1500 bucks, take that number and multiply it by at least 3.5. That's what you want to charge your client. Mm -hmm. There we go. You know what I love? <clears throat> um, first of all, dude, uh, <laughs> I'm going to call you Chris eventually. First of all, I just want to thank you again, man. Like you just keep, you have turned up to so many of our events in person in San Diego, our MavCon events, uh, the podcast, a lot. Like it's just been an absolute revelation and such a pleasure crossing paths with you and having you in our ecosystem. And I really want to thank you for everything you, you're doing and continue to do. I also want to say in the green room before we went live, I, I jumped in about three minutes before we were due to go live, right? And um, we kind of got chatting and Chris is like, well, you know, so I've got some slides. Do I use slides or do I just, you know, like I don't really need to because I know this presentation. I'm like, 
whatever you want to do. And he's like, I don't need slides. I love the fact slides just get in the way, right? I love the fact that we're just having a conversation and it's really, and we can go, kind of go off track there. Not many people have the experience and the confidence to just be able to have a really organic yeah. conversation without using the slides as a crutch, right? I don't use slides anymore because I think they just get in the way, but they used to be a bit of a crutch for me. So I just want to shout you out there and say, you know, oh, thank again, you. thank you, man. You clearly know your shit. And uh, this has been incredibly beneficial to people watching everyone share on the link in the, in the, um, in the uh, comments here. So dude to go.io, go check it out, run your next project through that. And I think what will happen is that you'll realize you ain't charging people enough money. Yeah, you guys need to be charging more. <laughs> Yep. Absolutely. You got to put your prices up. You guys deserve to make a lot of money. So yeah. this helps level, level the playing field, even if you don't have any data, so you can start charging what you're worth. I had a conversation with someone the other day who's like, I just don't believe anyone will pay me. And like, oh. I've, heard, I've had this conversation so many times, and I used to say this. But this guy says to me, I just don't believe anyone will pay me any more than $4,000 for a website. And I said, well, that's true. As long as that's what you believe and as long as that's what you say, that's true. Uh, but I can tell you, people, there are people out there paying a lot more than that for the same websites you're building. You don't need to add complexity or functionality or drop shadows to your website to increase what you charge, right? It's you just have to have a slightly different conversation with a slightly better caliber client. Yep. 100%. Right. 100%. Those folks that are running the million dollar agencies and making more money than you, they're not smarter than you. They're not more talented than you. They're not any better than you. They're just doing exactly what Troy said. They have a slightly different conversation and they've got a, a different, I would say, higher paying client. Yeah. And also I think, I think this, which is a whole other conversation, but I think they're just paying attention to different stories in their head. Yes. Yeah, they're right. not paying attention to the stories. The whole another conversation. The whole other conversation, <laughs> which we're definitely going to have at some yeah. point, right? You know, I love um, talking about the deep stuff too. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I got to bed last night, and I said to my wife, "There is definitely something about my identity, the way I identify. I come from the working class suburbs of of South Australia, right? I identify as a battler. I identify as someone who struggles and who battles, and where you know, like." It doesn't come easy to me. I identify as that. And that, I think, informs my behavior. Mm -hmm. And my behavior mm -hmm. informs my outcomes. So, you know, I'm like, I'm I just turned 48 last weekend. I'm like, why the fuck am I still listening to those stories that tell me I'm, I'm going to struggle and I'm a battler and I'm just a stupid little shit from the northern suburbs of Adelaide who went to a crappy school and doesn't deserve, like, why am I still listening to those stories? I'm 48 years old, for God's sake. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So for me, it's still a, it's still a daily practice to just let those thoughts flow down the river and, and, you know, reprogram them and pay attention to more, more useful. Yeah, thoughts. You got to catch, you got to catch yourself and literally say the story I'm telling myself is whatever. Yeah. yeah. You know, reframe it. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Uh, dude, thank you so much. This thank has been, Chris. thank you guys. Chris, your name, your name comes up with us. All the time. And we're always All like, no, we can't ask him again. We just asked him last week. <laughs> no, ask me. I am here, guys. Like, this is one of the things that fires me up. I love sharing what, I, what I've what i learned along the way, um, you know, because it wasn't that long ago where I wasn't making that much money. You know, the agency had high revenue, but not high profit. Mm -hmm. And it's one, two little switches. If you just mm -hmm. flip those two little switches mm -hmm. in 12 months, your, your life can be so different. Yeah, in a positive you're, way. You're an inspiration, my man, and we appreciate yeah. it. We really do. Yeah, yeah. thank you. When's much. the wedding? October 9th. So October a month 9th. from tomorrow. Oh, wow! Yeah, we're Good excited. Good well, for you. I know this is this is like the the uh, the third take of the wedding, isn't it? Like it was planned literally we the third. The yeah, so we got engaged January of 2020, yeah. and then we were gonna getting uh That's get right. married october of 2020 and then we yeah. had this little thing called COVID happen yeah. and then we're like ah we should be good by may of 2021 <laughs> yeah not the case and then we pushed yeah. it so this is uh this is take yeah. three well done okay. uh, because you just got engaged when you came to san diego to our event which is yeah 2020 in exactly like yeah, about yeah. a month yeah. um well, yeah. was, man congratulations. can't wait to see you guys again too by the and, way yeah man i can't wait to get yeah we can't either yeah 
It's going to be, it's going to be first good. round of beers on me. Awesome. All right. Awesome. <laughs> good stuff. All right. Thank you, Chris Martinez. Thank you very much for, uh, for Thanks, being a part of it. Thanks everybody. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is the agency hour here in the digital Mavericks Facebook group. Thank you. Crispy butter, Pete Perry. Thanks for being a we're part gonna of work it. On the, we're going to work on those baselines so we can do the intro. Good. And I'm going to work on using the right microphone uh, next time from the start. And we're going to start and we're going to build an intro and outro and we're going to start recording this. Now, here's, here's the mission. We're actually going to record this as a podcast in the group and we're going to do the intro and the outro and the sponsor messages and all that stuff here on the Roadcaster. So by the time we finish going live, there's no post-production that's going to slow the process down. It'll just be done. And then within like a couple of hours, it can be, you know, in the podcatcher, right? So that's the idea. We're working towards it. Stay tuned. It's going to be called the agency That's a smart idea. That must have been Max's idea. It was totally Max's idea. It was all Max's idea. I wanted to build a whole new studio for it. Right, of course. Let's do it on the iPhone, right? Uh, All right. Good stuff. Thanks for being a part of it, dude. Hey, we'll see you again uh, same time next week. All right.